Um, so thanks so much for having me here. Uh, I've watched this conference from afar for the past few years and haven't participated, and now I'm right at the end of my PhD, so it's really nice to be here and, uh, and talk to you all about uh, my PhD work. It turns out consolidating a whole PhD into <laughs> a few slides for this presentation is not the, the easiest thing, but I'm gonna do my best. Uh, and if anybody who is not a biologist, which I'm sure plenty of people here are, uh, feel free to chat to me afterwards. I'd, I'd be happy to break it down sort of in very basic, simple terms. Um, as you can see, this, this is quite a, a mouthful, this title. Uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll explain what sort of the punchline is. Uh, and just to, to recap, I'm a, a PhD candidate in Steve Jackson's lab at, at Adam Brooks in the CRUK uh, Cambridge Institute. Um, so the punchline of this uh, presentation is we discovered a new protein that helps fix our DNA. So if you get nothing else out of this, I hope you get that. And also this protein seems to be involved in a neurodevelopmental disorder uh, that also hasn't been characterized before. So these are two sort of novel aspects of the, of the work that we've done. So, um, so that's sort of the, the overview. Uh, I'm gonna get a little bit more complicated now. Again, apologies for the non-biologists, but hopefully this will make some amount of sense. So our DNA, obviously very, very important. Everybody knows DNA is important and uh, sort of governs everything that happens uh, in our cells um, and in our genes and, and everything like that. But what you may not know is that our DNA is constantly sort of under assault, so it's breaking all the time. Uh, tens of thousands of times per cell per day. Uh, so it's really important that that damage gets repaired because otherwise you get things like cancer. And so, uh, and the, the damage can come from all sorts of places, sunlight, uh, ionizing radiation, uh, all sorts of different sort of contexts there. Um, and so what happens when the cell uh, is, is damaged by one of these agents is that that damage is sensed. I've, I've taken away the gene names here to keep things nice and simple, but the damage is sensed. Uh, the signal's transduced through a, a couple of other proteins. Uh, and then there's a whole variety of effector proteins from different repair pathways, which depending on the kind of damage that's been done uh, will be recruited to help repair that damage. So if it's one kind of damage, you might get something like non-homologous end joining, which is one repair pathway. Uh, a different kind of damage might be repaired via homologous recombination, which is actually what I'm gonna focus on here. The reason I've highlighted these two is, is one that I'm gonna focus on uh, homologous recombination, but also if any of you know anyone who's been tested for BRCA mutations uh, for, for uh, susceptibility to breast cancer, BRCA1, uh, which is that that's the protein that's BRCA, uh, and BRCA2 are um, DNA repair proteins. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then just to make things even a little bit more complicated, it turns out every step in this pathway is regulated by other proteins, which can tell these proteins sort of what to do or whether or not to be degraded or whatever the case may be there. So there's multiple levels of regulation here, but the, the goal at the end of the day is to fix the DNA. And if that doesn't happen, you, get, you have problems. So, um, just to go over one of these repair pathways, again, I've, I've tried to make this very simple. Uh, homologous recombination, uh, I'll, again, I'll, I'll, I'll just highlight the important steps here. First, the, the, DNA, the DNA is damaged. In this case, I've used camptothecin, which is a kind of uh, chemotherapeutic that's used in the clinic at the moment. Uh, and this uh, drug induces uh, damage that's generally repaired through homologous recombination, which is one of these major repair pathways. So first, the damage is detected, as I said. And then a very, two very important steps happen. And these are the only two things you need to remember for the rest of the presentation in terms of understanding some of the data. Uh, one, uh, resection, which is where part of the DNA is chewed back, as you can see here, and it leaves this long, single-stranded piece of DNA, and it gets coated in these proteins called RPA. So that's one thing that happens. And then that RPA is replaced with another protein called RAD51. So resection, RAD51 loading. And then, you know, we'll just keep it simple and we'll leave it at that. Uh, and so if you have problems in either of these uh, processes, so if resection doesn't happen or if RAD51 loading doesn't happen, homologous recombination doesn't happen. So if you've gotten damage from something like camptothecin, you can't repair it and uh, the cell might die or uh, become cancerous or, or some other sort of consequence. So with that in mind, now we're going to get into some, some of the, uh, the actual uh, uh, experiments. So I did this big CRISPR screen where basically systematically going through and knocking out a variety of genes, so one gene per cell, uh, and seeing what happens if you knock that gene out, then treat the cells with camptothecin. So this is the kind of damage that has to be repaired with homologous recombination, right? And so if those cells die, and we analyze this through a sequencing method, if those cells die, uh, then it suggests that that protein is involved in homologous recombination. So we might expect out of this to see something like BRCA1. 
And that's exactly what we do see. So these are the results of one of the screens analyzed by a bioinformatician in our lab. We see uh, BRCA1 and its partner BARD1 come out along with a number of other positive controls, these black dots, again, not labeled here for simplicity. But we also saw a whole complex of proteins that's never been sort of associated with the uh, with homologous recombination or with, with the DNA damage response before. Um, and this was very exciting. It's called the CTLH complex. So that's what I've been spending my time researching. And Again, you can sort of uh, uh, focus right here on just one gene name, MAEA, that's the subject of my talk, and that is important because that is sort of the core component of this complex. So I created cell lines that are uh, deficient for MAEA and tested to see whether or not, again, just to confirm the results of that screen, uh, it turns out that when we use drugs that induce damage, uh, that can only be repaired with the homologous combination. Again, we see the sensitivity phenotype. You can see the big difference here between the normal cells and the knockout or knockdown cells. And when we treat it with another uh, drug, a laparib, which also induces that kind of uh, damage, we see the same effect. So these cells are clearly deficient for homologous combination, at least on the surface level. Um, it's also worth noting that camptothecin also induces replication stress. So when, when cells uh, replicate, they also replicate their DNA, which is very, very important. And um, we, we see here that uh, when I use other replication stress inducers, like acetylcholine and hydroxyurea, um, that, again, we have this very strong sensitivity phenotype. So DNA replication and HR seem to be depleted in cells that don't have MAA. That's, that's the main uh, idea here. Uh, one of the classic uh, sort of genetic uh, uh, experiments you can do uh, in your um, uh, uh, experiment is to take the gene out and then put it back in and see if you sort of rescue the phenotype. Do you see if uh, now they can repair the damage that before they couldn't because you've put the gene back in? So we did exactly that. We put the gene back. This is the sort of the fixed version of the gene along with a little tag on it. That's not really relevant for this uh, talk. Uh, we also put back a version of the gene that has a couple of mutations. These mutations are predicted to affect the activity of that protein. So that shouldn't rescue the phenotype. So we should see rescue with this one. We shouldn't see rescue with this one. And this is just the tag, so that shouldn't rescue it either, right? So that's exactly what we see. So when we uh, treat these complemented, so when we put the gene back, it's called complemented. So we've complemented those cells. And we see that when we put the gene back, nice and healthy again, uh, the knockout is here, this red one that has no, that has no uh, MAEA. Uh, we see this pink one here, which is just the tag. And we put these orange ones, which are, again, these mutated versions of the protein that should be activity deficient. Uh, we, again, see they don't rescue that phenotype. So uh, in both cases here, uh, you see sort of what you expect. So it's, again, very confident MAA is involved in uh, repair of this kind of damage. We see the same thing with, with the laparib. Okay, so going back to this, so just, again, to keep that in mind, we're going to talk about resection now. This is that step of the process where we get this chewed back piece of DNA. It gets coated with RPA. So we thought, okay, well, what part of the process of HR is MAA involved in? Is it resection, for example? Um, and so we looked directly at resection. We looked at uh, cells uh, after we treat with camptothecin to see if they have an increased or decreased level of RPA relative to the wild type. And you can see here that if you compare the gray, the gray uh, uh, dots, which are the wild type cells, with the red dots, which are the knockout cells, that there's no deficiency in resection. If anything, there's more resection. So that's clearly not the problem here. Uh, and we look at BRDU, which is, um, instead of looking at the proteins, we're looking at the DNA itself. Again, the same phenotype uh, where we're seeing not really any issue here. So resection doesn't seem to be the locus of where uh, MAA is acting. So of course, the next step is, okay, what's maybe downstream of that that might be uh, the, the sort of the problem here? And so uh, RAD51 loading, which is actually coincidentally where uh, BRCA1 is involved. It's also involved in resection, but it's, it's very involved in, in RAD51 loading as well. Uh, and so we looked at RAD51 loading, and we treated with IR. In this case, it's not infrared, uh, as in the previous presentation. It's ionizing radiation. And we looked with camptothecin. And in both cases, you can see that with no IR, you get a certain amount of uh, RAD51 foci, so these are little green dots that we look at in, the, uh, uh, in a microscope. Uh, and then when you treat with IR, you get a huge increase because the cell needs to repair all the damage you've just done to it. And the same thing when you treat with camptothecin. But with MAA knockout cells, you can see that there's a huge uh, deficiency here, even without any treatment. But once you've treated, you don't see the induction you see in the wild type. And this happens with both the chemical and uh, ionizing radiation uh, treatments. Um, Another thing we did during this project is to sort of reach out to clinicians because we saw in the 100,000 Genomes Project and a couple other databases that there are um, individuals with intellectual disabilities uh, as well as mutations in um, uh, uh, MAEA. And we found a selection of patients, about seven patients, who have a, a, um, overlapping features of global developmental delay, um, intellectual disability, and some other phenotypes. 
And we took two of these patients and modeled their mutations in our cells. And so E349K, so that's one of the two patients, has a mutation right in this really important ring domain region. I didn't really get a chance to talk about that, but it should, uh, based on this uh, um, uh, uh, location, cause uh, potentially a defect in, in the, um, the, the activity of the protein. And then we also have this other patient, which has a little mutation right at the very end of the protein, which isn't in the ring, but we're not sure really what that would do. So, I modeled these out and once again saw that the wild type rescues uh, the, the phenotype, just as we saw before, um, but very excitingly, the clinical uh, variants don't. So this starts to suggest that perhaps this neurodevelopmental disorder, which again hasn't been characterized before, may be underpinned by uh, this uh, DNA repair uh, issue or replication issue. And just to take this a little bit further, uh, we've collaborated with some uh, scientists over at uh, Birmingham University who are replication experts, and they've shown that uh, MAA knockout cells uh, which you can see here, these are the GFP only, these are the knockout cells, uh, have a real problem protecting the replication fork. So when DNA replicates, it forms a fork. I won't get into too much detail there, but basically these are very susceptible to being attacked by uh, other proteins uh, and if they're, not, if they're not protected. And so you can see that while the wild type uh, is doing well, uh, the, the knockout has this, uh, this severe issue and the clinical uh, variants, very interestingly, come somewhere in between. So E349K, uh, as we predicted, has this very similar outcome to the, the 3S mutant, that activity mutant I showed before, as well as this, uh, this knockout. But the uh, uh, clinical mutant with just a little mutation right at the end of the protein has sort of an intermediate phenotype. And we see that same uh, effect again when we look at fork stalling, when the fork is supposed to be progressing but just suddenly stops uh, for reasons that uh, are, are due to the genetics as opposed to some sort of drug. So there's a lot more phenotypes here. I can't get into all the details because there's just too much. Um, but uh, trust me when I say there's many more replication uh, issues as well. Uh, and we see these repeated, this, this phenotype repeatedly and, and these effects, these clinical effects very clearly. So um, with that, I will uh, just thank my lab, uh, particularly um, uh, Steve, who is my PI, along with uh, Chris and uh, 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 Guido, who are uh, my advisors. and. Um, and yeah, and with that, I'll just leave you on my conclusion slide, and thank you very much.